Hello and welcome to Psychology Wizard, presenting Badley and Hitch, 1974, Working Memory. Well, here are Alan Badley and Graham Hitch, who came up with this very influential memory theory back in the 70s. I think perhaps they both looked a little groovier than this back in 1974. There isn't a standard way of presenting and describing psychological theories, so I'm going to introduce you to my approach, and you can use it if it helps. My approach is the four cons, because every psychologically psychological theory has a context, involves concepts, comes up with conclusions, and involves a construction, which I'll explain in a moment. Context, first of all. Who and why? Um, whenever you're describing a psychological theory, you'll need to know who came up with it. And theories don't come out of nowhere. They are developed because there's a need for them. So the background to a theory is, is part of the description of it. Concepts tends to mean terminology. Most theories have got some key phrases and terms which are either unique to them or which are used differently from how those words are normally used in psychology. Conclusions. We're saying here, what claims does the theory make about human thinking and behavior? And the construction, is there a diagram? Now, particularly in cognitive psychology, there very often are flowcharts and diagrams that sum up the theory. Uh, students can make good use of these in their revision. So let's start with context, and the context here is Badley and Hitch themselves. Now, Alan Badley already had some fame as a cognitive psychologist and a researcher into memory. In 1966, his experiment into semantic long-term memory uh, is the cognitive classic study for the Edexcel specification. These two gentlemen were working on a memory theory, here it is, known as the multi-store model. Now, the multi-store model had been put together in 1968 by Atkinson and Schifrin, but really the ideas in it had been around a lot longer than that. It was starting to show its age, and Badley and Hitch were looking in particular at this aspect of the multi-store model, short-term memory and pointing out some problems with the way the multi-store model handled short-term memory. Let's take a closer look at short-term memory then. Short-term memory handles information in uh, short, small amounts, small capacity, um, maybe seven, eight, or nine items of information for limited durations, maybe up to 20 seconds. Short-term memory can be extended using a rehearsal loop, and that's about all we know about short-term memory as far as the multi-store model is concerned. Badley and Hitch had pointed out that short-term memory seems to be more complicated than that. Here's a little diagram showing us something known as the cocktail party effect. At a cocktail party, everybody drinks cocktails and talks to their neighbours. And the cocktail party effect happens when two people on either side of you are both talking to you and your mind becomes overloaded. You can't make sense of what they're both saying at once. Now, a number of psychologists have done research into the cocktail party effect involving dual testing, where participants have to do two tasks, one of which involves listening to one piece of information while at the same time doing another task involving a different piece of information. And what dual testing showed up was that although people get confused if they have to take on board two pieces of visual information or two pieces of acoustic sound-based information, they don't seem to get confused if they have to take on board some visual information and some acoustic information at the same time. It's almost as if short-term memory handles sound and vision separately. And this is the insight that leads to working memory. So, there we can see working memory taking its place in the multi-store model. It fills in the gap that used to be occupied by short-term memory, STM. In a way, working memory isn't so much a brand new theory of memory, 
it's more an extension or an expansion of the multi-store model going into more detail on short-term memory processes that were perhaps being treated in too simplistic a manner. Concepts then. Let's take a look at the main concepts of working memory. There's the central executive. This term <coughs> represents the main organization of working memory. If your mind is like a computer, and cognitive psychologists love to compare your mind to a computer, then the central executive would be something like Windows. It's on in the background all the time, it handles all the other programs, it makes sense of everything and pulls everything together, but it doesn't actually do anything interesting itself. You can't surf the internet with Windows, you can't download music with Windows. To do that, you need other programs. Now, Badley and Hitch compare the central executive to something they call a homunculus, which is a rather strange word that means little man. The central executive, they suggest, is like a little man in your head who is organizing your memories all the time. So what else is in the working memory? Well, it's not just the central executive, of course, because that by itself doesn't do much. It has got two slave systems, and if working memory's central executive is like Windows, then the slave systems are like programs or apps, for example, Facebook or Spotify. Let's take a look in more detail. Here we have the conclusions of the study. The central executive controls your working memory. It's operating in the background all the time. It's a multimodal memory system. This means it's not tied down to any one of the five senses. It can deal with sound or vision, or touch or taste or smell, or all of them at once. The first slave system is the phonological loop. This is the slave system that deals with sound. It uses acoustic encoding, and Badley and Hitch refer to it as the inner ear. The second slave system is the visuospatial sketchpad, the SSP, and that deals with visual encoding. It's the inner eye. So, a central executive that's in charge of everything, a phonological loop that handles sound, and a visuospatial sketchpad that handles vision. Now, you'll be glad to know there's a very easy to understand diagram that puts all this together. And there it is. Up at the top, you can see the central executive. It's got instructions coming out of it, and it's got information going back into it. It's in charge. Down on the right, and at the bottom, you've got the first slave system, the visuospatial sketchpad. That's where your visual memories are processed, things that you see. The visuospatial sketchpad holds on to those memories for a short amount of time, but it can, of course, get overloaded if there's too much visual stuff to remember. Over on the other side, you've got the other slave system, the phonological loop, and that's in two parts. There's the phonological store, which is a sort of warehouse for sound memories, for acoustically encoded memories. It's where you keep things that you remember hearing when you're having a conversation with somebody. The thing that they've just said to you will go into the phonological store, and you kind of need that to have a conversation, otherwise you forget what they were talking about. You've also got the articulatory process underneath. That's sometimes referred to as the inner voice. This is the other part of the phonological loop that is turning memories into sounds. Now, models like this need some evidence, and there's plenty, and most of it comes from dual testing. These, let me remind you, are studies where participants have to do two tasks at once, both involving some memory, but the tasks challenge different parts of working memory. For example, they might have to do something involving the phonological loop, like remembering what's being told to them, while at the same time something involving the visual spatial sketchpad, for example, looking at visual information like pictures. And all of these studies seem to agree 
that you can use the phonological loop and the visual spatial sketch pad at the same time and not get too confused. But if you do two sets of visual tasks at the same time, or two sets of acoustic tasks, then the loop and the sketch pad get overloaded and you start making mistakes. There's also some evidence from brain imaging techniques which seems to suggest that the phonological loop is in the left hemisphere, the visual spatial sketch pad is in the right hemisphere, and the central executive is in the frontal lobes just above your eyebrows. What's that other thing you see there, the episodic buffer? We'll come on to that. In 2000, Badley published a revised version of working memory. Here's the diagram. It looks pretty familiar. There's central executive up at the top. There's the visual spatial sketch pad and the phonological loop. But what's this? In the middle, we've got a new slave system, the episodic buffer. Now, the episodic buffer is not terribly well described. Badly had been doing research on patients with brain damage who couldn't use their uh, phonological loop and visual spatial sketch pad to store long-term memories, yet they still seemed to be able to recall stories, or at least details from stories. And this led Badly to think that there was a mysterious third slave system. The episodic buffer seems to take your short-term memory and bundle them together as episodes, as bundles or packages of memory that are all tied together into a little story. And these then go into your long-term memory. Later on, when you study Aaron Tolving's theory of long-term memory, you'll find out a lot more about episodic memory, but it seems to be the episodic buffer that creates episodic memory. It acts as a sort of halfway house between what used to be short-term memory and long-term memory. So, there you have it. The Working Model of Memory by Baddeley and Hitch, described in terms of its context, it's an expansion of the multi-store model of memory, of its concepts. It has the idea of the central executive, which is a homunculus, a little man in your head, and two slave systems, it draws conclusions that there is a visuospatial sketch pad, the first slave system handling visual material, and a phonological loop, the second slave system handling acoustic material. And later on, Badley proposed a third slave system, the episodic buffer, that draws memories together and turns them into episodes that long-term memory can store. Have a look out for another video on working memory when we will evaluate the theory.